Hi guys. Who, who of you uh, read the paper by Swansea Wall? Okay. So PCA, old method, new method. When was it? When was it first discovered? 1920s. 1901 was the paper by, I forget, it says here in the paper something, it's really old, it's, it's, a, it's a really old method by Pearson in an article called On Lines and Planes of Closest Fit to System of Points in Space, is the journal title. Nothing more than what we did today, right? Finding points in space and finding lines of closest fit. That was it from Philosophy, Philosophical Magazine 1901 by Cole Pearson. And then it was built on by people like Harold Hotelling and, and, and Fisher. And uh, Swansea Wald's father, Herman Wald, uh, was also instrumental in developing ELS. So look, this tool is not, it's not a new tool, but it's, it's, it's well established. And uh, for those of you that read the paper, which were some other names for PCA? Factor analysis? Yeah, anything else? Fact analysis? Anything that you remember? Singular value decomposition is another way of doing it. Anyone in the back, another name? How about current room expansion? The current current room expansion is used in uh, computer computing and software circles for um, image analysis. They are called image analysis using PCA, current room expansion. Uh, the singular value decomposition is also another way of working. So you've got all these various branches of science and engineering using PCA, but calling it different names. Okay? So it, that, that was there for historical um, point of view. In the paper, they talk about dimension reduction. Okay? So what does dimension reduction mean to you? Someone talks about dimension reduction, what are they referring to? Using a number of columns. Using a few number of columns, not rows. We always have to deal with big data sets with large number of rows. But if we can, we'd like to reduce the number of columns. Because especially on today's uh, systems in, in chemical processing plants, we get a lot of redundant columns. Can we reduce those columns down to a few of them? And then we always have to deal with the same number of rows. And rows are easy to deal with, right? When someone says to me, I've got a big data set, I'm like, well, so what? Big data sets don't mean anything. It's very easy to deal with a big data set. We've got parallel computers. You can rent a computer cluster on Amazon.com for this copy costs me more than it costs to rent 24 hours of CPU time on Amazon. I can rent a 24 CPU cluster with 16 gigs of RAM and super fast processors for less than two bucks a day. Uh, so dealing with lots of data is not a big deal at all with the computing systems we have. It's dealing with the columns that's a big problem because there's no way we can visualize all these combinations of the columns. We'd like to reduce the columns down the large number of rows. Okay. So that's what I want you to get from the paper. The paper also covered some of the, the details of PCA and P, and, and actually right at the end they covered PLS. But we'll leave the details for next class. So if you didn't get a chance to read this paper, I would recommend you do. Um, and I'll also have another <coughs> paper assigned for next week, which I won't have a discussion like this on. It's more, if you read it ahead of the class, you will understand the following class topics much better. Okay, so this one I did want you to read. There's a lot of good stuff in here, so if you didn't get a chance, I, I really want you to go back and, and read it. There's some important things in there. Okay? So the other thing I just wanted to quickly mention, if the geometric interpretation of things like dot products is something that you're not comfortable with, um, and, and you really should be, because you see these things in first year, second year math classes. This is an excellent book, um, Carol Green and Chandra Reddy. I think I've got it listed on the literature website. Um, and it, Mathematical Tools for Applied Multivariate Analysis. It's very geometric, like all the pictures, oh, there's a lot of pictures in here that show these point swarms, and they describe what singular value decomposition means, they describe what a dot product so if you do get into this area as an area of research, I would recommend you to go into this book. If it's just even something you want to get more comfortable with, it's a good thing to do. I think it is in the library. Okay, let's take a look at the software. 
The first data set I want to look at here is uh, the P's data set. So if you go to the data set website, I don't think I have an internet connection right now, so I can't do it, but there's the internet, uh, when you go to the data sets website, and you click on a link, it tells you a bit more about the data set. So there's always a bit of background description, tells you where the data came from, if, if I know where it came from. Um, tells you the shape of the matrix, what you can do with these data files. Most of the data sets on this website, you can do absolutely anything with after that. You can use them for your research, you can use them for personal use, you can use them for making money off, I don't, I don't really care. Um, and then there's some other information about data. The most important part is the actual download. Uh, right click on that and you can save, oh, okay, so, so I don't have a connection here. Right click on it and save link as, and you will download the CSV to your hard drive somewhere. So you should have done that already prior to this class. Now let's go take a look here at that data set. So open, start the software and say uh, file new project and import data. And we want to take a look at the P's data set. So just a bit of background about this data set. It's uh, from a paper here from the 1989. Uh, a group of judges were assembled to taste a variety of peas. So in uh, the Nor Norwegian countries, they frozen veg is popular. Okay, so they take the peas, freeze them, and then consume them later. So the judges were assembled then to measure to assess the taste of various varieties of peas. And so the, the panel of judges measures certain properties, and we're going to look at those today. And then they also measured other properties by, um, by a vision system. They measured the color of the peas. They subjected it to chemical analysis to measure the levels of glucose and a few other properties. So that, those are the types of variables. These are, it's called a sensory data set. So it's the sense, the taste of properties of various varieties. So you open the data set, you, the first question you're asked about is whether it's normal data or batch data. We'll deal with batch data right at the end of this course. So for now, most of the time, normal data. This is a good screen to check whether you've imported what you think you, you want. So sometimes you're not always 100% sure that the data made it in successfully. This is a good way to check before you proceed. The top row will tell you the, the variable name. So each P was subjected to a measurement by a tenderometer, the percentage dry matter in the P's, the percentage dry matter after freezing, sucrose percentage, glucose percentage by one method, glucose by another method. Column six and onwards are the measurements by the judges. So the judges taste each batch of P's and they say, this one has a flavor of so much. And these numbers are the averages of, um, of the judges. So this judge judged the flavor of the peas to be 6.5 on a scale of 1 to 9. They measured the sweetness, the fruity flavor, the off flavor, and then the mealiness. Okay, so those columns, uh, six, seven, eight, sorry, those, those six columns, flavor, sweetness, fruitiness, off flavor, mealiness is like it's got a powdery consistency like a flour, that's a mealy uh, pea and then hardness. So those are six measurements judged by the panel and using their expert tongues. <laughs> okay, whiteness, color, 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 and skin, those are five values that are measured by other systems. So I presume whiteness, color one, two, and three are measured by a camera system. And then skin, I think, is just a, a, a subjective measurement of the skin's appearance. I'm not 100% sure of it very well. If you scroll down, you can see that all the values are present. We've got no missing data. Every single cell has a number in it. But, and this, if you knew more about this data set, you would just make sure that what's in the rows, what's in the columns, matches to what your expectations are. So in this case, it is correct to say OK. And we'll also deal with block data later on. So for now, you can just say uh, finish up. This is the next screen which you should spend a bit of time with. Whenever you import a new data set, especially if it's the first time you're looking at the data, you should always look at the variables one column at a time. The software tries to make it easy for you. Um, I know we said at the beginning 
if you've got many columns, looking at the time series plot is going to be pretty hard. But the software tries to make it easy by, if you click in a particular column, and then you use your left and right arrow keys, you can scroll through the histograms for each column pretty quickly, okay? And get a feeling for the variability of the data. Okay, everyone can reproduce that on their laptop. So scroll left and right with your arrow keys. So for those of you that have laptops in front of you, I want from Charlene and Jane Kanyasu's group at the back, I want you to tell me one thing you pick up in the raw data. The group at the back there with Blair and, um, sorry, I don't know the other people. So, uh, do you guys have a laptop? Yeah. 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 So I have one other property that you see in the raw data, and then the group here at the front, tell me something else you see in the data. So scan through the data and tell me what you've observed univariately that stands out as being interesting, in particular the relationships between the variables, what do you notice? What do you guys notice in the data? Uh, just one observation you see. You notice that a lot, like in terms of off flavor, the judges seem to be very biased toward the left side. So not a lot of off flavor. Okay, so the earlier, this is off flavor called off flavor is, Okay, so you're saying these values of lower values are more flavor. Yeah. In a histogram, right? Oh, in a histogram. Okay, so it's yeah. You know. Right, so this is not definitely not a normally distributed variable. Is is one thing. Okay. This is no, not normally. Oh, so you're saying not so off so flavor would be a high off flavor. There's not many p varieties that are high off flavor. There's only a few. Okay, good. Uh, oh, back there. Anything that you guys noticed? Uh, color 3 is normally distributed, okay? So if I move over to color 3, yeah, seems pretty normally distributed. We've got an even spread throughout the data. Any other groups? What did you guys notice this year? So flavor and sweetness tends to be high values here. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so what's very interesting is that all of you that have that have given remarks have looked at your variables one at a time. Okay? And that's exactly what the plot is asking you to do. When you move your mouse here, you're looking at one variable at a time. So it's no surprise that all of you gave observations on a single variable. But take a look at some things this way. Let's scroll all the way back to the beginning. If I move my mouse between tangometer and dry matter, and I oscillate between the two, and I look at my time series plot, what do you notice? Okay, so they the, have two totally different scales, but what do you, what do, you, do you see any relationship between those two variables? They're correlated? And if I move between dry matter and dry matter after freezing, can I alternate between those two? Notice how these values barely move. The shape of the time series plot is the same between the two columns. Okay. So that's not surprising because if the PEs had a high amount of dry matter, Prior to freezing, after freezing, they're also going to have a high value of dry matter. Okay, so it's no surprise that those two variables are correlated. But you see how hard it is to find relationships between variables in this setting. Okay, especially if I have two variables on the opposite ends of the columns, it's I'm not going to be able to find those relationships visually. Okay, um, unless I rearrange my all of my columns, but there's so many permutations that I can do. So. This plot is good for really just inspecting your raw data to look for the most extreme outliers. And, and that's what it should be used for, is to look at univariately for outliers. You can also go change the selection down to rows, and then as you move your mouse up and down, you'll see the variables ordered from one up to 17 show you their raw data values. But again, this is of very limited use if your values have such large ranges. So this variable here has got very high numbers. These are low numbers. You're not seeing anything really here because of that 
biasing the in the axis. So again, a very limited use other than to really find extreme outliers. But it's always good to inspect your data visually if you're unfamiliar with the data set. So let's say okay, we'll go past that. It asks you to save the project. I'll just save it to my desktop, yes. And then you should be at the screen. Sorry. You just continue on. Say finish up from the previous step. Yeah, say okay. Save save your project. And you land up at the screen. Sorry, did I go too fast? Sorry. So everyone's at this point? Yeah. At the back, you guys are all at this point? Okay. So now what we do is um, you follow the tabs from left to right. We won't spend too much on time on these today. As we go through the course, we'll, we'll start looking at some of the other tabs. Let's look at the variables one of, is of the most use to you right now. It indicates the name of each column in your matrix. The green indicates that the that variable is included in your current analysis. So if I have to build a model right now, it will peak that variable. It shows the mean and the standard deviation of each column. MC tells me that that variable has been mean centered. UV means that that column has been scaled to univariance. Um, and we'll look at some of these other uh, interpretations later on. What I want you to do right now is exclude everything. So select them all and click exclude. And then go back and just include the following six. Flavor, sweet, fruity, or flavor, mealiness, and fire. So just include those six variables. Exclude everything and add back only from flavor up to hardness. I only want to look at these six variables because those are the six variables that were used by the judges. The other variables were calculated in some other way. So we're just going to look at the six variables from the judges. So everyone's, everyone's done that? Okay. And then you say okay. Preparing data set for model, and then it asks you for a model name. I always just write base model. It's the first time I'm looking at this data set. You can usually put something more descriptive here because what will happen is we'll build multiple models here on the right hand side, and it's sometimes helpful to give it a, proper, a name to help you distinguish model one, two, three. So the base model, say okay, and, and it indicates that I'm familiar. So expand the drop down on the right hand side. Gives you a little bit more information. It says this is going to be a PCA model. Right now I have zero components, capital A is zero. I have 60 rows, K six columns. Expand the other. It, it knows that it's PCA because there's nothing else you can do with it with a single data matrix. We'll, we'll see later on if we'll make a few of this. Batch block is no, normal Y, all these are, are, are empty right now. So the part that you've all been dying for is how the hell do you fit a model? You go and you click on those little buttons up there. Okay. Because we haven't fit any components yet. So use auto fit for now. Okay. And they refit the model. Three components have been calculated. Very quick, very easy to fit three components. Everyone has this plot up on the screen right now. Yeah. Okay, what is the meaning of that plot? What does it tell you? Yeah. So let's break it down. We've seen this in the class today. This is a bar plot of the R squared explained by the model for every component. Ignore the red column for now because we haven't covered Q squared yet. We've covered only R squared in the class. Okay. So the first component explains 90 some percent of the variance in the data set, one component. The second component goes up a little bit more, the third component a little bit more. Here you get the exact breakdown here. First component explains 93.8%. The second component adds an additional 3.25 third component adds 1.57%. Okay? 
it uses some algorithm that you talk about most of us. Okay, so one component explains a great deal of variation. We've summarized 93% of the original variance in that X matrix. X now consists of the six values measured by the judges on N is equal to 60 rows, so 60 samples of keys. X is now the sentiment scale data. We can, we can capture 93.8% of the total variance in X is captured by one component. Okay. In the, another way of saying that is the pair of vectors, P1, transpose, and T1, that vector, these two vectors capture 93.8% of the variance. If I want to write that down as well, another way to say it is x hat is equal to t1 p1 transpose. This prediction from t1 p1, which is equal to this column t1, times vector p1 transpose, multiply this n by one vector by this one by k vector gets me gets me an n by k matrix x hat. Right? That x hat explains 93.8% of the variance in x. If I add a second component, I'm adding an incremental small amount of additional variance explaining 3.2%. Let's go take a look at what those components look like. So on the left hand side here's some helpful shortcuts which we'll use for now. The first one is T1, T2. So this will plot for me a scatter plot of those data for the 60 observations. So there's 60 points in this plot, one for each variety of P. And the horizontal axis contains my T1 values, which range from minus 6 to plus 4. So the T2 values, which range from plus 1 to minus 1.5. So T1 and T2 then, and then over here, so here's my T2 vector, my T1 vector my P1 vector, my P2 vector. Those two vectors are being plotted here. I'm plotting a scatter plot of this vector against that vector. And this is indicating, remember, the T1 value indicates where along that P1 vector, the distance along that P1 vector, where every observation is. So what's helpful then is to take a look at T1. Okay, we're seeing, remember we said that points which have similar T1 values have similar X values. Where do I get that from? Well, let's take a look back here. The T1 value is given by the value in, in X1 times P1. Uh, to the, the second entry, let me be, yeah, I'm just dropping the I subscript. Previously I always had XI1 and XI2. I'm just dropping that off for now for convenience. So I'm saying X1 uh, is this row from X vector. So X1 is this entry here. X2 is that entry here times P11. I will still keep the subscript for P1. So take the first entry P1 for the first component plus X2. To one and so on up to X capital K PK. So if two now two rows in our matrix have similar score values, so let's say here's observation 22 and 16, they've got pretty similar T1 and T2 values. It's it's an indication that since the P's are fixed, okay that their x's are similar, okay? So any observations where the, the, the scores are close together 
here indicates that their raw data is also columns together, their x's. Now these x's could come from anywhere in the matrix, right? So here's my matrix x. One of the rows could be up here and one of the rows could be down here. It doesn't matter. I will still calculate a t1 and t2 value for this row. And I'll calculate a t1 and t2 value for that row. When I plot them and they happen to lie close by, it says that their original x data were, was similar. So that's the key concept from interpreting a score plot. Points which are close together on the scores have their raw data close together in the original matrix. Let's take a look at the loadings and see what's going on here. I just want to, for now, take a look at the P1 as a bar of it. So we're looking at the coefficients for the six values in this first component. Okay. So this is giving me how these weights are. When I form my linear combination, I'm multiplying by P11 for flavor. P21 corresponds to the weight for sweetness. P31 is the fruitiness, and then 4, 5, and 6 are the other three properties. Okay. So, given this interpretation over here, what would a large value of T1 mean? What would be the characteristics of the P's that happen to have T1 value that's large? So, high levels of flavor, so high value of flavor for its x, high level of sweetness for x2, high fruity flavor, low whole flavor, low level of fruitiness, and not very hard. So it's a nice juicy sweet pea is a high value of T1. Okay? Is the is the interpretation I make from that. So judges don't the judges don't know about latent variables. They just measure these six values. When we analyze the data, though, we start to see this first component. Values that have high values of T1 describe peas which are very flavorful, very flavorful, sweet and fruity, low levels of all flavor characteristics. They're not mealy and they're not hard. In other words, they're soft and they're just nice and juicy. Okay. So that was a good P, I guess, would be right up here, high levels of T1. So these P varieties over here have high values of T1. We can say then that they have those characteristics of being nice, soft, and juicy. What would you say the P's over here would be with low values of T1? Little rocks. Right? Little rocks. Little rocks, okay. So that's a good description. These P's, to get a negative value of T1, so if I wanted a low value of T1, I need to multiply a negative by a positive, or I need to multiply a positive by a negative. Either way, if I sum up terms that have this sort of combination, I'll get a negative T1. So I would then say a P that is, here's a positive P1, okay? So high level of flavor, so to get a negative T1, I have to have a P that has low levels of flavor, low levels of sweetness, and low levels of fruitiness. Okay, Because I'm multiplying a positive coefficient P by a negative value. If I take a negative coefficient over here, so let's take hardness, for example. I'm taking a negative coefficient of hardness, I must have a very hard P, or very meaty P, or a very off flavor P and low fruit, fruitiness, low sweetness, low flavor, and I combine all of those together, I'm going to get a very negative T1. Okay, does everyone see that? that? That's the key concept I want you to take off from today's class, is remember I said right at the start of the class and on the website, we're gonna look at today what does T equals XP mean? This is exactly what it is. So if we're just looking at the, at the vector case, T is equal to XP, as a vector, we're really looking at this equation and seeing how can we move this equation around. This is always a scalar number over here, which is the product, the dot product of two vectors. What are we doing then um, here? We're, we're 
we're creating a linear combination to get the scalar value here. That's the key thing I want you to take on from today's class, is what, how do we interpret this linear combination? So this is a nice case study because the first component here explains 93 or 94%, 93.8% of the total variability in the, in the data set is just due to one factor, whether the P is soft and juicy or rock hard. We really, if we take a look at it, that's all that's in our data. All these 60 Ps really either have, are on the juicy side or they're on the, on the very hard side or somewhere in between on a, on a scale of T1. But it, there's, no val, there's no latent variable that captures that that we can measure. So what the judges, what we do though, is we get six judges together and we ask them to measure flavor, flavorness, sweetness, fruitiness, or flavor, meatiness, and hardness. And if we combine those six values using a positive weight for the first three and a negative weight for the other three, we've created this new latent variable. Last week, at the end of the class, I asked you to think about a latent variable, and I apologize, we didn't get around to uh, going around the class to, to talk a bit about what latent variable we came up with. We'll, we'll do that for the next class, so, okay, so we'll keep, the, keep your ideas for what a latent variable is for the next class. But here's another example for P's. That first latent variable captures the vast majority of the variability, and it's really just due to one factor how soft and juicy or how hard that P is. Um, and the characteristics that go with it, fruitiness and sweetness and so on. Okay. Anyone want to guess what P2 is modeled in? How would you do that? If you want to, we've, we've understood what this first component is and what it means. What is the second latent variable in these days? What would you do to find out? Take a look now at P2. We've understood what P1 means. It's, it's this direction related to the, the taste of the peas. Let's take a look at P2. So there's no shortcut here on the side for P2. There's only one for P1. So I'll show you how to plot P2. If you go up to analyze and we choose loading plot, change the plot type to bar. And then the x-axis is going to plot the range. So it's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 6. And then the y-axis, we, we want P2. And then just say add series. So it shows it there in the data table, and then you say OK. another shortcut so you don't well if you've got p1 uh, let me just quickly show everyone else if you've got p1 already plotted up like i have down here there's a shortcut up here you can go change this drop down to component two it will just change the values on the y-axis to the second component it's, it's a quicker way of getting it thanks okay so p2 then is defined by these coefficients okay firstly we see that sweetness it's got almost no no weight. Okay, so immediately our second term doesn't contribute to our linear combination for T2. Okay, so we can cross out, uh, well actually let me just rewrite it here for T2. T, don't confuse this. So T2 then in exactly the same way as X1, but now we're saying P12. So this is the first loading for the second component. Take the x2 value times p22 and so on up to xk. K2. So in this particular example, sweetness has got a loading value of zero. We can disregard that term from the linear combination. So what would a high t2 value look like in this data set? What would be 
be the characteristics of a P with high T2 that's low wall flavor. Low wall flavor, so a negative uh, times a negative and two positive, so low wall flavor, high needles, okay? And maybe hardness, high, high level of hardness. You, we can for now just drop this off relative to these other three variables. This, these two are relatively small. So for now, we can just tentatively disregard it. So a high T2 value, high neediness, very hard, and with uh, low levels of off flavor. Okay, I can't think of a P that tastes like that, to be honest. Like, what's a P that is hard but not off flavor? Come to me, I, I, well, maybe it's like you know, spoiled ones or spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiled and, and, and just flowery, but still got but doesn't have full yes. flavor. <laughs> maybe an unripe peach. Maybe an unripe Yeah, yeah. It, is, it hasn't had chance to over ripen and maybe develop more flavors, but still meaty and hearty. Okay, and then the, the opposite of that would be a negative value of T two. Okay. So now let's come back to the score plot. With that interpretation, what would observation 36 look like? What would be the characteristics of observation 36, P36? Yeah. Hard, mealy, with low levels of more flavor. Because it's high T2, but has low, has a roughly zero T1. Okay? So these values over here are really defined by their T2 values. They have no they have no components or no projection along T1. They have T1 values roughly zero. So these observations here are really just defined by T2. These observations over here are defined by T1. These observations here are defined by high values of T1 and negative T2. Okay, so these, remember, were the soft, flavorful, and juicy peas. These also have high levels of no hard, oh, low levels of hardness, yeah. low levels of meaningness, and they have some off flavor perhaps. Probably these are the more, these are overripe in some way, that the off flavors have started to develop. Okay, because remember T2 has that off flavor component. So it had a large, um, so if we just sketch P2 here, there was a large negative off flavor. So if we want a high T2 value, we need a large off flavor value. Okay, so these, these P's down here have high levels of off flavor. These P's have very low levels of off flavor. And, and opposite for our meaning as particles. Okay, so you can see that as we go along this along the score plot in the horizontal direction, we're changing T1. Going along the vertical direction, we're changing T2. And then variables that, or observations rather, that are in these quadrants here have some characteristics of both components. Okay. Yeah, okay, so the question is, are, is this observation an outlier? Outliers are always very hard to define. <laughs> so outliers have come up in today's class over and over. To me, there is, there is no right or wrong definition of an outlier, a very clear definition. An outlier is purely a point that's different given the other relative data around it. Okay? And from that point of view, yes, this is an outlier. There is very little other data around it to tell. So let's go take a look at what is different about this point. Okay? And the way you do that in the software is you circle that observation 51. See how it's become red, and then you ask it the software well, why is that point up there? And use this tool up here called the contribution block, which we'll discuss in the next class. But let's take a look at what it says. Yeah. Okay. So it tells me that this point over here is up there because it has high levels of all flavor, meaningless and minus, and lower levels of those. Those very nice. What? Shaking it. It's gross. Oh, it's the gross <laughs> Yeah. Nasty. Okay, so 
when you get this, we should, let's go let's go back to the raw data to verify. The question came up in earlier in today's class. Do we go back to the raw data? Yes, we should. We should always go validate what we see here in the raw data. Let's take this particular example as one way. So observation 51, go up here to um, analyze and then say raw data. Okay. Then change the either pick the, the one or the other here so that we can highlight observation 51. We want to go take a look at observation 51. In other words, we want to for observation 51, show me the variables for observation 51. So that's what they're saying. Okay. And you can see that this is showing you the set the actually um sorry, I need to step Let's just do that. Go back here, analyze raw data. Change that to I want to see the variables for observation 51. There's a checkbox over here, scale the y-axis. If I leave that checked, it's going to show me the centered and scale data. If I uncheck it, it will show me the raw data. So I've already shown the data there, uh, centered and scale, so let's put the two side by side. Okay. I'm going to put these two plots side by side. On the left is the centered and scale data. See the range of the values? This is I've got a, a, a minus three to plus three to plus four on this axis range. So this is centered and scale data. Over here I'm looking at the raw values. The judges assign numbers between one and nine. So this range here follows that. But you can see here how the, the relationship is, is the same. Or the interpretation of it is the same. These keys here, whether you're looking at the centered and scale data or you're looking at the raw data, have low levels of flavor, sweetness, and fruitiness. And, and as Jay said, it's a really gross peak, very fiery, <laughs> flavor. Okay. So we, we've validated what we've seen in the contribution plot back in the raw data and the center scale data. Next class, I will talk about how that contribution plot is calculated. So, I'm just debating, uh, do you guys have a few minutes to look at another data set or not? If you need to leave, please leave, um, if you have a time constraint. Otherwise, I'm just going to look at one last data set. Oh, okay, sure, you want to see how to do that? Okay, so, not, yeah, so it's a good idea to do that. Uh, let's select these two outliers. Okay. Let's say we, we consider only those two P samples to be outlined. I like them and click the X here. Oh no, that's your Sorry. Oh, it's the garbage can. So exclude selection. So if you highlight the two points that you want to exclude as outliers, click exclude selection. And if we come back, it, it will throw up this new window for you and say, look at the observations. If you scroll down, you'll see those two observations have been omitted from observation 27 and 51. Okay. Everyone following up to this point? Up here. Exclude selection. Okay. So we're rebuilding the data. We're going to rebuild the model. The variables we're going to keep, notice, are exactly the same as before, the same six. The observations now, we've, we've, we've taken out the two that we believe to be outliers. We're going to say, okay. Preparing the model, and it asks you for a new name. And this is where you can say something like, uh, from model one, removing 5127. Just something, something to remind you later on when you go and open this project maybe a few months later but you're sharing this this project file with a colleague so that you know what you did to go from model one to model two to model three just say okay and the process repeats again so we've got this new model over here now notice that n is equal to 58 whereas previously n is 60 and you can go auto fit and it will rebuild the model. You can go look at the 
score plot T1, T2, and it's very similar shape actually to before. Uh, just that those two observations were over here have gone away. Indicating to you that those two outliers didn't really bias the model too much, but we'll, we'll come to that in the next class. Okay. Let's uh, let's just take a, a second here now. Is, is everyone up to speed with 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 this data set before I move on to the next one? Just to take a quick mental check. Everyone's okay. And let's move on to the next data set. So you can save this and close it down. So file save and then just say new project, import data. And the data set I want to look at is, again, food related. We're going to look at food consumption. Okay, so open the food consumption file. And it contains normal data. This data set contains some missing values, shown in red. I think there's three missing values if you scroll across the whole data set. But the, the meaning of this data set is for every one of these European countries, Germany, Italy, France, and so on, up to Ireland, this is data from the 70s or 80s, and they've, they've polled over the entire country the percentage of people in their country that drink real coffee, essentially people that drink instant coffee, essential people that drink tea. So if you quickly scroll down and you go to countries like Ireland, they drink lots of tea. Okay? Uh, England, 99% of the population drinks tea. <laughs> Sweetener, biscuits, how many of people eat biscuits? Again, the British love their biscuits. Powdered soap, tin soup, potatoes. Uh, scroll along here. There's all sorts of different foods. Crisp breads, yogurt, olive oil. Who loves olive oil? Scroll again, 92%, probably some of the Mediterranean. Okay, so this data set is food consumption, percentage of the population that consumes certain foods. Okay, say okay. This is just a normal data set, so finish that up. And you can scroll along the columns to take a look at the patterns in the data. So just to just a quick scan across here, instant coffee. Uh, this is just showing you by observation number, which in this case is a country. When there's a missing data, there's a, a gap in the graph. And so on. Okay, so it's a pretty small data set, actually 20 rows here. You could easily look at this in printed form in Excel and probably perform the same conclusions, but we're going to look at it from PCA today. So say okay. Save it. Okay, and then the first model we're going to build, we're going to use all the variables at this time. We're not going to exclude any variables like we did before. I'm going to use all the observations and we'll leave those other tabs for another day. So at the bottom here it tells you this model is going to be a PCA model. Say okay. Model name, game base model. And if we click auto fit up here, it goes and adds eight components. Yes. What was it? Missing value. Sorry, what happens here? Missing value. We have some missing value, right? In the data set? Yeah. We had some missing value. Yeah, it, PCA can handle missing data. Yeah, it keeps that ver those variables and observations. Yeah. And we'll talk about that next class now. A bit more about how missing data is handled. Okay, so. R squared, what do you think of the R squared values this time? Is it bad? Why is it bad? So low. So low. Okay. I, okay, so yeah, there's some issues that we need to talk about. One is interpreting R squared. Relative to the other data set, yes, it's low, but for this data set, this may be a great R squared. Right. We'll talk about that in, in coming classes. So one thing I want you to be aware of is don't add components just to get a certain R squared that you're looking for. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that in some detail. But we see here, first component explains 32% of the variance in the data set. Second component adds an additional 19%, bringing the total 
then put two components up to roughly 40, about 49, 50%. Yeah, by two components. And then the third component takes you to over 60%, and so on. We'll, for now, again, just look at the first two components in, in, in this class now. So, close that down. Let's plot T1, T2. And Shafari, do you see any interesting things or anything that's surprising in this plot for you? Are the relationships expected, unexpected? So you see, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a you, you're talking, referring to like a line like this, or like, like that? Uh, yeah, that way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so these these points tend to form a direction along that way, those points form all across that line. I don't know if that's coincidence, or if that, I mean, I wouldn't read anything into that, other than to say that there's a progression, obviously, as you go from there to there. What is that progression under the data set we're going to look at next? Um, the other observation here, yeah. oh, we were going to say, like, you know, the, the four on the bottom right, they're all like North and Eastern countries, and the Scandinavian four on the left are, are all like Southwestern, and then the ones in the top right are all like Middle European. Middle European, yeah. And is that from what we looked at in today's class, is that expected, unexpected? It should be expected. It's expected. Countries that eat similar foods should fall together on the score plot. So Britain, uh, UK, England here, and uh, where's Ireland? Is over here, Luxembourg, Holland, Netherlands. We're saying these people consume similar foods. The Scandinavian countries consume their foods in similar ratios. And then the Mediterranean countries, Italy, Spain. Austria is a little bit weird here. Yeah. Austria is unusual. Portugal, Italy, and Spain, that's expected, but um, maybe Austria is a time to be a little weird. Um, oh. Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's an unusual one. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is to uh, do a contribution plot and see why Sweden is, is out there where it is. What, why, why is Sweden up here from a contribution plot? Actually, that data set was by uh, people with Swedish looking names. Actually, that data set about the peas is from the Norwegian Food Research Institute, so no surprise there <laughs> about the frozen veggies. Lots of crisp bread, it sounds like IKEA. Okay, so that's, that's uh, why Sweden is out there. Let's take a look at the loading spot. They hate instant coffee. They've got a good taste. They know that to drink real coffee. Okay, so um, that, that's biased. I like instant coffee. Um, let's take a look at the loading spot. So P1, P2. Yeah, P1, P2. So we're, I'm looking at P1, P2 this time as a scatter plot, not as a bar plot. In the last data set we looked at as a bar plot, P1 is a bar plot, P2 is a bar plot. This time we're looking at P1 
P1P2 is a scatter plot. And for now, one way I want you to interpret this scatter plot is as follows. Mentally superimpose this loadings plot with the same score plot. Okay? I'm going to close this up over here and try to illustrate what I mean by that by putting these two side by side. So countries that have high T1 and high T2 values <coughs> will also have high P1 and P2 values. Okay. So countries that have high values of T1 and T2 out here will consume lots of tin fruit, apples, powdered soup, instant coffee. Countries that are high T1 values and low T2 will consume a lot of crisp bread, frozen fish, frozen veg, like we saw there earlier with Sweden, lots of potatoes, but they'll eat less garlic and less olive oil. Okay. So you can mentally bring these two plots together because it follows this interpretation over here, that the T's is a combination of the X's and the P's. So to get a high value of T, you need a high value of P, with its corresponding x. And a high value of t2, you also need a high value of p with its corresponding x. So it's, it's, it's perfectly OK to look at these two plots side by side and mentally bring them together. And in fact, that is, is an option in the software here. If you go up to analysis, Analyze, there's the Loadings By plot, which does exactly that. So it plots both the scores and the loadings uh, in a different pattern for you. But unfortunately, here it's dropped off the names of the countries. So the names of the countries are the blue dots, and the, and the black dots are the, are the food. So it's not so helpful here in this particular instance. But um, mentally, you can do the same thing by just putting the two plots side by side. Yes? If you right click and click labels and name it, the countries will pop. Oh, okay, okay, in the buy plot. Okay, so yeah, the, the remark there was right click on the buy plot and we can, we can ha add the country names back. Uh, one other thing just to end off today's class, let's take a look at the third component. We fit several components to this model, um, but for now we've always looked at P1 and P2, T1, T2. Let's quickly take a look at T1, T3. And you can do that with a shortcut as the people in the back realized earlier, by just leaving that T1, T2 plot up, change that y-axis to T3. Okay. So now we've got T1 still on the vertical, on the horizontal, but T3 on the vertical axis. Okay. What do you notice in the, in the third component? What's, what stands out in the component for you? And we have the good old British and Irish walk there by themselves. Why? So what, what, why in the third component, how would you answer the question, why are England and Ireland have high values of T3? If I'm not, I, okay, so, so far, we've looked at the class, in the class, how do we go in this direction? Okay. I, in today's class, we've looked at, given X's and, and fixed P's, how do you get a high value or a low value of T2? Now I'm asking the question the other way around. Why are England and Ireland have negative T3 values? They don't like real coffee. How do you answer that question? One, you have to see the loadings for P3. So in this plot over here, change the loadings to go to be exactly the same, P1 versus P3. The British consume jam and tea and tin soup and much less orange and real coffee. Okay? 
and let's and you can always verify that in the contribution plot. So let's draw the contribution plot for let's say Ireland and take a look at it. So low consumption of real coffee, high consumption of jam. Okay, so so today's class. Okay, so let's just uh, let's just summarize what we've covered today before before we uh, close. Okay, so what we started off with today's class was we, we really just looked at an introduction to linking variable methods from a geometric point of view. And the reason why I've done that is you'll see as we go through the course. Okay, so just a second here, let's just focus to end up today. PCA is a topic that you can interpret from many points of view. Even myself, I've looked at PCA now, I've been looking at tools around it for the past 10, 11 years. Every so often I see a totally new and interesting way of looking at it. And so it's really hard for me as an instructor to find a good way to teach it to someone for the first time. Because I know many of you are more geometrically inclined, other of you are more mathematically inclined, and some of you uh, might just find a different perspective on it easier to understand. So today's class I've tried to introduce it geometrically, I introduced it algebraically, and We've also looked at it kind of from a conceptual point of view as a group of, of linear combinations that add up to certain score values. And then we've looked at it in the software as well with some case studies to try and solidify it. Don't expect to have a full grasp of the concept yet. And if you feel yourself uncertain of your interpretation, that's quite normal. You will find as you go through the next class, we'll even introduce two or three other ways of looking at PCA. When you start looking at the algorithm, it might suddenly make sense to you. Um, and then you can go back to today's notes and then see the geometric function and see how it all fits together. So I've, we've looked at several ways of introducing PCA. And then here at the end, we've looked at some software tools to try and see how it's actually what we're going to do in next class is we're going to come to this question that everyone's dying to know how to calculate the components, how many components should we calculate. We'll look at some concepts regarding limits on the PCA model and how to use the PCA model in new data. Although I suspect with the amount of work we're going to cover here that I'll bump this over to the following class. Okay? So that's what we're, where we're heading. What I would like to do this week is to, if you haven't already read the uh, paper by Swanti Wall, which is paper 13, please read that, but also read paper 12 on the site. That talks about cross-validation. Cross-validation is a tool that we're going to use to answer this question. How many components should we calculate? And it's related to that Q-squared number you can see in the software that we haven't spoken about. So that paper will help you for next class. And then I will post a very small assignment on the website where you'll analyze the data set in the software and you'll hand in just a one page report to me at the start of the class. And we'll then review that data set at the start of the class. Okay, so that is an assignment for grade. Very, it will be a very small problem that you'll just solve in the software that we've covered today. Okay.